Hello everybody, I'm Challenger Jacku and welcome back to part 2 of our brand new challenge series. When we take on the dark story of Sonic Adventure 2 to see where it's possible to beat the game without collecting any rings. If you haven't watched the previous part when we tackled the hero story, I highly recommend you do so and the links will be in the description below. However, before we begin, if you love Sonic content or challenge videos in general and you want to see more content like this on the channel, do me a favour and smash the subscribe button, like the video and hit that naughty bell. You guys came out and smashed the initial goal, thank you so much for your continuous support. And if you have any ideas for future challenge runs that you'd like to see me cycle on the channel, slate them down below and I'll definitely see what I can do. Now as always, I'll quickly go over the rules of this challenge, although they're pretty self-explanatory at this point. First of all, if you collect a ring at any point, it counts as a fail and we have to restart the stage. Next, the run will begin in Iron Gate and will conclude upon the defeat of Sonic. And finally, yes, this run will be glitchless as they weren't really needed during the routing. Now, without any further ado, let's jump straight in. Our journey begins inside the base of the prison island. Immediately, something is awry, as the base enters lockdown due to an intruder who we soon discover to be none other than Dr. Eggman. Upon discovering the diary of his late grandfather, world-renowned researcher Gerald Robotnik, the etchings of a top-secret military weapon that was shut down and sealed by the government, from the fear of the destruction it may bring, alluring the Eggman to the remote base in his ambitions of once again conquering the world after his failure in the previous game. I just love how in the hero story, Gun was so insistent in capturing Sonic to the point they were willing to sacrifice the many innocent lives during the gun chase. Yet when Eggman infiltrates the top-secret base in order to get his hands on quite literally a weapon of mass destruction, nobody bats an eye. Anyway, the first stage of the run is a mech stage, ironically enough, Iron Gate, and for the first time ever in a mainline Sonic game, Eggman is actually playable, and whilst it's awesome to finally be able to play as the Mad Dog himself, I can't help but feel that it's a missed opportunity. Throughout the series, Eggman has had so many batshit insane and wacky machines, that the fact that we are limited to just a mech is rather anticlimactic, but as a whole he plays virtually identical to Tails, and Iron Gate itself really isn't that interesting. There are literally only two ring trails present in this entire stage, Stage, literally two. For the vast majority of the stage, you don't even need to worry about rings altogether, which is just mwah, beautiful. So why am I even mentioning this stage anywhere? Well, the challenge comes in two specific portions of the level. The whole gimmick of Iron Gate is that you need to destroy the doors locking you into each level of the base. You destroy them by obliterating the four corners of each door by locking onto them. This poses a problem when ring containers are placed directly behind the door, as Eggman will lock onto them as well and his shots will actually pass through solid collision. To avoid this, we need to destroy said gates from a distance and that way it'll be too far away to lock onto any ring containers. With that sorted, Iron Gate is extremely simple to complete ringless, and I hope it continues to be this straightforward. Upon locating the cryogenic pod, Eggman hacks into the database using his newfound knowledge, and once he placed the Chaos Emerald into the console, the pod before him activates rising to the ceiling of the room, revealing the ultimate life form himself, Shadow the Hedgehog. And yes, just like Gun before him, even Dr. Eggman mistakes Shadow for Sonic initially, though nobody ever bothers to point this out as it doesn't fit their narrative. Anyway, with Gun now alerted to the scene, Shadow springs into action in the first boss encounter of the run, Hotshot. Despite the different name, Hotshot is virtually identical to Bigfoot, the opening boss fight for the hero story aside from one key attack. Just to preface this now, I will not be going over the rival fights again in this video, as they really aren't any different aside from playing as the opposing character. If you haven't already and want to see if those battles are possible to beat Ringless, I highly suggest you check out the previous part where we covered all of that. Like Bigfoot, Hotshot will soar above the arena gunning Shadow down with his many pillars. Like before, you can loop Hotshot mid-flight by using the boxes as a higher platform and jumping into the cockpit, although I did struggle quite a bit this time around for some reason. Towards the end of the battle, rather than launching a barrage of missiles like Bigfoot, he would instead charge up a beam attack, locking onto us via the red reticle. Whilst it looks intimidating, the attack takes up so much time to actually charge, you have more than enough time to land the finishing blow, defeating him ringless. Blown away by Shadow Z's in dispatching the guard bot, Eggman questions Shadow on his previous words relating to granting him a wish, something Shadow doesn't really answer directly, instructing the good doctor to collect more of the Chaos Emeralds, and meet him aboard the defunct Ark. Meanwhile, in the desert area, we are treated to the introduction of Rouge, who after forming a rivalry with Knuckles the Echidna, races their counterpart to gather the missing pieces of the Master Emerald in our first treasure hunting stage of the run, Dry Lagoon. Now, Dry Lagoon is the first of Rouge's treasure hunting stages, and like Wild Canyon, the stage itself is not remarkable, sporting only a few contained areas this time reachable by the turtle we need to save from the tyranny of the gun mechs. I will say that Dry Lagoon is slightly harder simply as the area is more fast overall, but yeah the goal remains the same, simply collect the three master emerald shards contained in the stage to move on. Before we continue, I know I said in the previous part that I'll be using the original Sonic Adventure 2 radar, however for the dark story I decided to instead use the mod to restore the functionality from Sonic Adventure 1. Whilst routing the hero treasure hunting stages, the nerf radar didn't really make the stages any harder in the 
context of the challenge. If anything, it just drew them out to the point of tedium. So I feel comfortable with using the mod this time since it doesn't impact the overall difficulty of the challenge. Anyway, the first Emerald Shard was located in the starting area. After jumping over the loop of rings where Rouge spawns, we climbed up to the highest level of the stage so we could explore from above through a glide. Eventually, we did find the piece just sitting on the platform, so we move on to the next section by riding the turtle, as no other pieces had a signal in this place. One aspect that I honestly adore is the contrasting environments of each of the stories. You see, whilst the majority of the level themes and design remain consistent between both the Dark and Hero campaigns, the aesthetic can change quite drastically. Ward, Canyon and Dry Lagoon pretty much share the same basic geometry, however whilst Knuckles' stage is set in a rugged and decrepit canyon, Rudy's Dry Lagoon is staged in a beautiful oasis. Not only do they contrast greatly, they also represent the characters who traverse these stages amazingly well. It just breathes some level of variety into very similar layouts, making each of the stories feel unique unique, even if the level design borrows heavily from each other. In the final area of the lagoon, I was able to follow the signal of the third emerald piece only to hit a brick wall. The radar indicated that the emerald was extremely close by, but I assumed it was somewhere in the wall, only for this to be proven false, because of the lack of the exclamation mark. Since I couldn't find it originally, I instead opted to look for the second emerald piece that was placed upon a higher platform in the centre of this section. As it was placed underneath a ring trail, I had to be a little careful when grabbing it. Impressively, the game placed the final emerald shard within the leaves of a nearby path tree, only finding it as it came right into the face of the camera as I was climbing the wall. An extremely crafty hiding spot that took me a fair while to actually find, but with that be complete dry lagoon ringless. Venturing back to the hidden base in the heat of the desert, Eggman is confronted by a mass army of gun mechs patrolling the outside due to his actions at Prison Island. In order to reach the space called the Ark, he has no other choice but to fight his way through to the entrance of the base. Sand Ocean being the second mech stage of the Dark Story really turns up the heat in a significant way. Unlike Iron Gate, rings are placed all over the show, whether they be in the form of ring trails, in containers, or the damn balloons that don't appear until you're really close to them. A quick note that I need to mention is that because Sonic Adventure 2's PC port is buggy as hell and forced to route each of the story in stage selects on a completed save file. This is because for whatever reason the game will forever crash at the Prison Island subplot in both stories. The game will never allow me to pass Green Forest or White Jungle respectively, meaning in order to do this challenge I have all of the upgrades by default. However, I never use them until I reach the stage that they're unlocked in. Sand Ocean is the only stage so far that you're unable to beat Ringless with the upgrades enabled. The reason being is the pillars throughout the stage that you need to collapse to form bridges across. At the first pillar after the platforming section you need to destroy the three explosive packs with two ring containers placed at either side of the pillar. If you do this with the blaster upgrade, the radius of the explosion will actually shatter both ring container boxes and it's impossible to proceed further ringless. Thankfully, Sand Ocean takes place before White Jungle, so I was able to start a new story and reach the stage without the game crashing, collapsing the pillar and continuing on from here. Moving forward, you have these gun tank things that you need to destroy so you can use the base as a platform. These containers are everywhere, and some even near ring containers, so you have to make sure Eggman only locks onto the tank itself, otherwise you'll have to start over. The camera was a massive pain in the arse here as well as we tried to platform over to the next section, as it really wasn't giving me a clear shot of the rings as we moved forward, and there is a literal ring container box placed right next to the the pillar we need to collapse. Something I couldn't see as the camera refused to lower down. Honestly, Sonic Adventure 2's camera is even worse than the one in Adventure. Anyway, once we breach the gap destroying the three sets of tanks, you have these stairs that you need to climb to reach the higher platform. As rings were placed in the centre, we had to hug the wall and try to jump up, but for some reason Eggman just wouldn't climb up them. He eventually did after scrambling for a little while, it was just way harder than it needed to be. The next checkpoint was just in reach though as we collapsed the next pillar. This next section is filled with tedious blocky platforming where we have to slowly ride the platforms until we can breach the gap ourselves. It's frustrating as the area itself is surrounded by quicksand, so if you're the impatient type like myself, expect to die a lot here. You also have to ride along the edges of the platforms in order to avoid the ring trails, however if you have enough momentum you can actually jump from platform to platform, it's just a tad risky due to the tanky controls. Something weird happened after reaching the next checkpoint. You see, once we clear the boring platforming section, we have to clear out a few more of the tanks and jump to a higher ledge. It was as we platformed our way down to the next section that Eggman landed on the platform but then just kinda clicked through it somehow. Now I don't know why that happened exactly, it's just bloody annoying as he lands in the quicksand. The next time though, Eggman did land as normal, and so we continued on resisting the ocean to nuke the gun robots that were melting our health, as two sets of ring containers plus rings were placed everywhere. The camera was really starting to get on my nerves at this point, as it just refused to react accordingly. I know that we aren't exactly approaching the stages in the way the developers intended, however that's what free cam was for, so it's just bizarre that they didn't include the option. Fortunately, we are able to survive and after another blocky platforming segment, the final portion of 
the stage was just beyond our reach, having to collapse several levels of pillars without destroying any ring balloons, as well as contending with the crushers and the fast amount of gunmax impeding us. In Sonic Adventure 2, you can't actually lock onto the balloons as you would with the ring containers, so as long as you just make sure that you're beyond them before shooting down the enemies, there really isn't any way for you to mess up here. Once we get through all of that, we finally clear Sand Ocean without collecting any rings. Hot on his ass after Shadow successfully infiltrated the global bank to steal the Green Emerald, the police corner the ultimate life form standing above the Golden Gate Bridge. It's here where we see a glimpse into the horrors of Shadow's past, revealing a mysterious girl pleading with Shadow to fulfil her wish before she is presumably killed, for a reason unknown to us at the moment. Out of all the things she could have asked for, Shadow's first thought is to avenge her death by killing all of humanity. Okay, I understand that Gerald alters Shadow's memories in between the events of his arrest and the current events of the game, however she could have asked for literally anything else. She could have been asking what you wanted from McDonald's, or for world peace, which is actually what she wanted by the way. Or you know, what Shadow's favourite pancake was. But no, it must be that she wants revenge on an entire world over an event that Shadow can barely remember to begin with. With that out of the way, Radical Highway is the first speed stage in the Dark Story, and wouldn't you know, it's actually the hardest out of all the Shadow stages that I should beat Ringless. The first half of Radical Highway is incredibly self-explanatory, made up by the numerous linear highways. Ring trails typically the double variant are placed along the centre of the road, so they're easily avoidable if you hug either of the sides. Our first major hurdle in the stage appears after we take the first rocket over to the checkpoint. Beyond the checkpoint there's a loop that has a ring trail along its exit that takes us into the building with its many springs. At first it appears to be a simple matter of just jumping down to the lower path right, however if you try to do this, similarly to that one section in Green Forest, Shadow will be suspended in the air until we actually guide him back onto the highway. This will only occur if you jump off the right side. If you try the same thing on the left, you will fall into the bottomless pit below. So by using a spin dash jump, we jump off the highway on the left side and circumvent the building completely with a home and attack landing on the road ahead. This can be incredibly awkward as the camera in Sonic Adventure 2 is not as controllable as the previous game. Because of the set angle, you can't actually see what's below you until you descend, so my only advice is to use the highway ahead to line shadow up with the road you can't see. And of course, use the home and attack as a means of correcting your trajectory. Destroying the gun beetles through a home and attack chain you want to climb up the final ledge with a standard jump because of the ring container placed there. From here though the rest of Radical Highway isn't too different as to what we've already cleared. There are barely any ring trails aside from the few along the linear highways and the next few loops are actually passable by jumping through them. The Golden Gate Bridge does have a bunch of rings along the fencing that we would normally need to grind along but there is a platform underneath us that we can just harmlessly jump down to and then spin that jump over the bottomless pit. So far, Radical Highway appears to be rather ordinary, especially when you compare it to some of the lengths that we had to go to in the previous episode, and you'd be right to think that. The vast majority of the stage, Radical Highway isn't difficult at all. All of this changes in the final set piece of the stage, an automated corkscrew bombarded by jet fleets that will take us to the goal ring. Now the jets aren't an issue here, whilst yeah they can damage you technically, it will only occur if you mess around on the corkscrew. Even then you can just wait until they pass by before traversing through. The problem stems from two things directly, the two ring trails placed after the height of their respective loop and the automation. If you ever saw my adventure challenge series then you'll be aware of how the automated sections work, which does translate over to adventure 2. You'll only be pushing in any given direction if you're holding the stick in these sections. As long as you aren't touching it you won't move, so we can line shadow up preemptively and then charge a spin dash to jump through the loop and land on the highway ahead of us. Well, in theory. Unlike Emerald Coast where the level is naturally declining, this corkscrew is ascending so our jumps have to be incredibly precise. At first thought you'd figure all you would need to do is jump at the height of the loop, however the automation affects Shadow's momentum in a weird way, as if you're moving too fast and you jump, rather than ascending vertically, Shadow will be pushed to the left and fly far from the corkscrew, resulting in a death. If you're moving too slow, you just don't have enough forward momentum to reach the other side of the highway, even with a home and attack cancel. In short, it is possible to clear Radical Highway ringless, you just have to fight the automation and get extremely lucky. Explaining exactly how I manage this is way above my pay grade, as to be completely honest, I just kept grinding a section until we managed to clear it, and I can guarantee that this will be the hardest skip we ever have to perform in this challenge, as we clear Radical Highway without collecting any rings. With Rouge taking an uncanny interest in whatever Eggman is planning, the mysterious bat closely pursues discovering Eggman's hidden base. However, to actually enter, she discovers that she needs three keys to open the door, leading us to the next treasure hunting stage of the challenge, Eggquarters. Between Eggquarters and Death Chamber, I certainly prefer the former due to its more spacious design. However, both stages have their annoying quirks and that comes in the form of the guard robot thing in the case of Eggquarters. You see, there is this security bot patrolling the entire stage on a determined path. If it sees you at any point, its green light will turn red and it will attack you with 
his lasers. Given the challenge that will spell certain death for Rouge. However, you can hide yourself from the guard. If you place Rouge within the shadow either casted by the pillars or the walls themselves. This way, the guard will simply go by you without knowing you're actually there. Now this can be tedious due to how slow it actually moves, which really does drag this stage out. So much so that on my first attempt, I was stuck in the spawning area for three whole minutes, as I was looking for the second key that was extremely close by according to the radar. On my second attempt, I eventually found the key buried within the wall with the hieroglyphic pictures, which raised a weird quip with the Emerald Radar mod. Whilst the mod will alert you to the other two pieces from the start, the exclamation mark that appears to indicate where a piece is on the ground does not. I didn't know this at the time, so I was searching this damn room for a good five minutes before digging around and accidentally discovering it. After a while, we eventually find a signal for the first key in the blue chamber, only to run into a number of rings forcing a restart. I have to admit this was simply due to my impatience, the level drags on to an absurd degree that I just wanted to find the keys and move on with my day. Upon respawning though, we quickly track the key down, which was floating along the upper walls of the open hallway in the red chamber, before returning to the shadows as the audio cue for the guard started to play, indicating that it was closing in on our location. We almost actually ended up getting caught here, as I circled back the other way to the linear corridor only to run right into the damn thing. We were able to quickly hide behind some wooden crates though, which knocked the guard off our scent thankfully. The final key was located in the blue chamber underneath the hieroglyphics on the ground, allowing us to complete headquarters ringless. Not a difficult stage by any means, it's just boring due to the amount of waiting around you're forced into in order to avoid the guard bot. Finally accessing the inside of the base, Rouge discovers a transporter with a destination set to this base called the Ark, alluding to a mission of some sort she follows suit to see what exactly he's up to. In order to reach the control room of the Ark, Eggman explores the rundown research colony, its secrets veiled by a blanket of darkness in our third mech stage of the run, Lost Colony. Lost Colony, whilst not a very difficult stage even under our stipulation, is certainly memorable because of the gimmick that's implemented. With the Ark having been shut down five decades prior, the stage is covered in a blanket of darkness, providing camouflage to the many gun mechs and obstacles that make up the stage. You'd figure that because of said darkness, Lost Colony would be extremely annoying to play through, but not really. I think it's due to the botched lighting of the battle port, as if anything the darkness reminds me more of the fog in Superman 64, as rings and even the gun mechs to an extent stick out like sore thumbs. If you are having any trouble in traversing the stage, then you're able to light the way forward by destroying the gun mechs, as the resulting explosions will illuminate your path for a brief time before returning to normal. The first half of the stage is nothing to write home about, with how visible the rings are, we simply walk by them destroying the many gun mechs along the path, and explosive packs will open the doors. There is a ring container box that you need to be careful of when riding the pulley though, so just make sure you're facing forward before opening the door. When we reach the square shaped corridor that contains the hover upgrade, we take it now because of the drank hitbox of the ring balloon force in the restart. There is also an unhealthy amount of ring containers shrouded by the many gun crates, and as Eggman's shots can face through literal solid collision, this yet again forces a restart. I highly recommend you wear on the side of caution and just run by the enemies in the way here, since we can take multiple hits it doesn't really matter if we do take damage. Now that we finally have the hover upgrade, this will make the rest of Eggman's mech stage is far easier to traverse, and once we destroy the steel boxes with the rockets we're free to continue on. With the checkpoint at arm's length, we accidentally ran right into a balloon that thankfully housed the first aid kit. I would have been distraught if I had to go all the way back to the pro checkpoint, but fortunately that wasn't the case. Do you guys remember the strong words I had for Eternal Engine? That one part specifically with the narrow bridges? Well, it's a good thing that we tackled the hero story first, as the moment we reached the outside we were greeted by an identical scenario, only this time we had to contend with the natural darkness of the stage itself. To Lost Colony's credit, we only had to cross one level of these platforms rather than the several of Eternal Engine. Either way, I wasn't amused in the slightest once I reached here. However, it might just be me, but the ring trails appear to be far more spaced out compared to Eternal Engine, so for some of the bridges we were straight up able to hover our way across, as long as we used the fence as a launch pad. The set camera also caused a few issues for us when it came to judging our position relative to the fence, which ended up causing Eggman to fall off and land right next to the ring trail. His hitbox must be smaller than Tails's, as despite being that close he didn't collect any of the rings, providing us with the window to jump back on the fencing and hover our way to the next section of the stage. I know you'll feel tempted to defend yourself from the gun beetles, but please resist that urge. Beyond the next door is a ring container for our trouble, so there is a good chance you'll lock onto it by mistake forcing you to go through this entire section all over again. Reaching the next checkpoint, we've pretty much cleared the hardest section of the stage. From this point on, the only things standing in our way are the multiple waves of gun mechs that barrage you in the rising platforming sections. You are free to destroy them here, so don't let them gang up on you. There are rings that you actually have to worry about the trails in the last few corridors, and with that, Lost Colony is completed without collecting any rings. Meeting Shadow at the control room, the legacy of his grandfather's research is revealed, boasting an ultimate weapon with the power to destroy an entire planet with the right power source, codenamed the Eclipse Cannon. Realising that this is why 
they needed the Chaos Emeralds. The duo are rudely interrupted by Rouge the Bat, who offers to help them, giving Eggman the Chaos Emerald she possessed in return for the Emerald Radar, so she's able to track the rest of the Master Emerald pieces. And Eggman, he suddenly trusts her. Look, I understand he wants the Chaos Emeralds, but mate, you have an IQ of 300. Surely you would question something. Like, how did she even get here? We know, but does Eggman just assume she flew up to the yacht with her wings? Anyway, according to Rouge's intelligence, three of the Chaos Emeralds just happen to be locked within a vault stashed away on the prison island, a prospect that Eggman isn't exactly keen on, given he literally just raided the island a few days ago. With their plans set in motion, Eggman serves as a distraction, allowing both Rouge and Shadow to sneak onto the island undetected, in order to fulfil their roles in this grandiose plan. Not going to lie, I really do love the dynamic of Team Dark here, as their personalities really do bounce off of each other, although I do find it pretty funny that each of them are rolling it for themselves and their own motives. No Weapons Bed is one of two stages that remotely stand out, as for some reason they actually influence the physics of Eggman's mech, the other being Cosmic Wall. In the case of this stage, Eggman's ground speed and acceleration have been cranked up considerably, providing a far more accelerating experience as the mechs kinda control better here than most of the other stages. Now I have no idea why this is actually the case other than the long stretch of harbours that we need to dash through on our way to the goal. Like Iron Gate, this level is quite a godsend in the context of the challenge, as rings are eerily absent throughout most of the stage. Weapons bed opt in to provide you with the countless gun mechs and airstrikes that will melt your health if you're too reckless. There are checkpoints though, so the lack of rings only helps us in our challenge run. Dashing across the first harbour, there are rows upon rows of gun mechs that are just sitting there. They aren't active so they can't kill you or anything, but if you lock onto them, you can destroy around 20 at a time, really racking up the perfect scores for an easy A rank. Once we take care of the gun mech and the crates blocking our way, we reach the first checkpoint hovering across a bottomless pit to reach the next section. We did end up taking damage from the airstrikes as I wasn't really anticipating them. Rather than taking out the enemies to the side though, I found it way safer just to flee, destroying the metal crates to clear our way, and hovering over over the one platform with a ton of ring containers to reach the pulley. Riding the pulley to the next harbour, we have to destroy the gun mech in the way, but aside from that, nothing in the way of obstacles really impeded us going forward, at least until the end of the harbour, when we were sniped upon evading the spinning spike balls. Thankfully, the next checkpoint was just ahead, after we cleared out the number of gun mechs floating in our airspace. In this next section, while there is a lot going on thanks in part to the amount of fleets bombarding you with the pellets, it's pretty much a facade. Unless you stand still, nothing here will even come close to damaging you, so the only thing that we really Really needed to deal with was the gun mech at the very end, standing guard over a bridge with a rare ring trail. The enemy itself wasn't any problem, the ring trail door had the potential to be. It's awkward as there are two ring trails placed right next to each other filling the entire length of the bridge. If there was only one we could have potentially just squeezed by it, but not in this case. If you look to either side of the bridge door, you may notice the green gun cargo things that move across the entire length of this bridge. They do in fact have collisions, so as long as we stand on one of them, we can ride it to the pulley outright avoiding the ring trails along the bridge itself. Reaching the end of the stage, the relentlessness of the military's assault only escalated, leaving us close to the red after we were damaged by a hiding gun mech upon avoiding the airstrikes. With the goal in reach though, we just ran for it, taking care of the final gun mech and the final barricade to clear weapons bed without collecting any rings. Now, Security Hall is one of those stages that you either love or hate, and believe me, many people hate this place. It all stems from the time limit, Eggman originally gives Rouge 15 minutes to grab the three Chaos Emeralds before the timer blows up, however Rouge is adamant that she only needs five. Still though, five is plenty and I for one absolutely love this stage. It all stems from the fact that we have to collect the Chaos Emeralds, this aspect of Security Hall was always so cool to me as a kid. We have to traverse the frigid halls of the prison island searching for the three Emeralds within the vault, and despite the time limit, the stage itself is rather small, only containing a few key areas. It really isn't difficult, even with the stupid nerfed radar. My personal strategy for security hall on a regular playthrough is that I like to cover the entire ground floor first, before using the rocket or various pulleys to search the higher levels of the stage. Usually one of the emeralds is always placed down here for me, only this time it wasn't. So after a little bit of searching, the third emerald on the radar was giving us the strongest signal, and sure enough, containing one of these wooden crates upon this floating platform, we grabbed the blue emerald before continuing on. Whilst the signal for the first emerald was only growing, I still couldn't figure out where it was low. Located. Using the pulley to reach the secret area of security hall filled with the lasers that really make you feel like a thief on a major heist, the third emerald appeared in one of the deactivated gun mechs. I couldn't believe how easy this was so far, and I guess neither could karma. Upon using the drill dive to enter back into the central area of the vault, we ended up hitting a laser killing Rouge on impact. As I mentioned in the hero challenge, like Sonic Adventure 1, the emeralds do act as checkpoints, so we still had the two collected, but it was still a bit of a pill to swallow. I'm not entirely sure if the emeralds actually changed location upon respawning like in Sonic Adventure 1. I could be wrong, but I believe once you enter the level, they will only change if you quit and then re-enter from the stage select, as the emerald remaining still appeared to be in the main area. Unfortunately, I still couldn't find it, and after two minutes of searching a panic slowly starting to set in, we eventually tracked it down, hidden in a wooden crate placed on the support beam of the vaults on the second level, completing security hall ringless. 
With the three emeralds now in the possession of Team Dark, Rouge is confronted by Gun themselves, piloting yet another one of their strangely named mechs, Flying Dog. I know Rouge's whole thing that she's a double agent for the government, but surely they knew the island was about to blow up, right? Did they really want to risk losing their only connection to Eggman by locking her into the vault? Names aside, I have no idea where they even came up with these designs, as Flying Dog is literally a big foot with its claim feet ripped off. Thanks to this, it can no longer ground, meaning you'll need to approach from above to land any damage safely. Luckily for us, we're playing as a character who can actually glide. And since Gun have effects for taking L's, they were gracious enough to place two metal fences on either side of the arena for Rouge to climb on. All jokes aside, this boss is basically identical to Hotshot in terms of its moveset. As long as you're high enough in the air when you start gliding, just drill dive into the thing. Rinse and repeat on Flying Dog is a breeze to complete without any rings. The only thing that you would need to be careful of is the fact that upon connecting with the cockpit, the game will lock up Rouge's controls for a few seconds. This means if you're unlucky like I was on the first attempt, Flying Dog has the chance to fly into you, killing you instantly. But aside from that, this encounter is nothing remarkable. Rouge now locked in the vault with the emeralds, something about the situation stirs something in Shadow's memories. Visions of the questionable memories from earlier urging Shadow on to save his unlikely teammate. With only 10 minutes remaining, he races through the perpetual rain of White Jungle. I do have to ask though, I understand why Shadow has a jungle stage to go inside with Sonic's Green Forest, but Shadow, just use Chaos Control. We know for a fact you can perform it without a Chaos Emerald as you do so in the final battle with Sonic, that's all you gotta do. Anyway, like Green Forest, Shadow is placed on the time limit indicated by the time on the right side of the screen. However, the game is far more generous this time around, providing us with an extra 2 minutes compared to Sonic's 8. But believe me, you'll need every second from what this stage has in store. For the most part, this stage can basically be summed up as a hard mode to Green Forest, simply due to the fact a lot of the obstacles we faced last time are also present here, like the ring trail along the very first runway. Using a spin dash jump, we can just use the loop reef fingers again to fall our way over this first trail, although the same cannot be said for the next ring trail just ahead of us. It can be tricky because of how narrow the section is, but as long as you hook the right side of the road, you do have enough space to squeeze by, riding the vine to the next section of the stage. Even the loops here aren't safe from the ring plague, forcing us into a number of death defying jumps to reach the other side, which can be a massive pain in the arse due to the god awful camera. As long as you use the homing attack as a correction tool, then it's just about possible to reach the other side, but it can be extremely tight to pull off. And once we've once again used the loop roofing to skip another two ring trails, we can hit the dash pad taking us to the next section of the stage. Thanks to the amount of enemies present here, we used the bomb container to clear the way, only to be greeted with a bunch of rings leading up to the crusher. Rather than just jumping over the ring trail, we instead spin dash jump over to the right side. And due to our starting point, we actually had enough height to jump over the crusher and gunmates completely, using the vine to reach the next section, hugging the walls of the cave to eventually hit the checkpoint. After a number of awkward jumps to skip several loops, we hit a dead end, so to speak. In order to reach the final final section of the stage we need to use the light speed dash to bridge the gap to the spring, and at this point in the story Shadow doesn't have that ability, however White Jungle is a stage where he unlocks that ability by revealing a hidden pathway via the running crate to our right. From our vantage point though the gap wasn't too far, and so I was sure we could bridge it with a spin dash jump as long as we jump further to the right to avoid the rings we can home and attack onto the spring to clear this no problem. The only obstacle standing between us and the go ring from this point was the final set of rings along the loop. Like before we had to spin dash jump over to the other side which did take a few tries because of the awkward camera angle. However, upon finally clearing this, we take the several finds over to the Go Ring, completing White Jungle without collecting any rings. Upon his stalemate with Sonic, a panicked Eggman urgently requests for Shadow as the island was set to blow up. With little time remaining, he does what he should have done from the beginning, saving Rouge and the Chaos Emeralds from their untimely demise with Chaos Control, although he later suggests that he only did so for the Emeralds. Another one of his latent memories, however, reveals that there was more to Shadow on his path than simple revenge. Anyway, with six of the seven Chaos Emeralds now in their possession, Eggman contacts the citizens of Earth for a warning, destroying half the moon with the Eclipse Cannon. Whilst the demonstration was more than a success, neither Eggman nor Shadow were thrilled at the fact that the Eclipse Cannon needed more time than they thought to be used again, making it clear that they needed the last emerald in order to unleash its true potential. Thanks to Rouge's insight, they discovered that the final emerald was actually in the possession of Tails, awarded to our hero for his actions in stopping Eggman's attempt at destroying Satan Square with a missile in the previous game, thus Rouge's task with pursuing the Tornado 2 in the next stage of our run, Route 280. In the same vein as Tails' is Route 101, Route 280 is an outlier compared to Rudy's traditional stages, taking to the road in a dildo mobile? Okay, I know it's supposed to look like a head. Saying that doesn't really help the case here, does it? Anyway, I find it rather bizarre that Rudy's the one to have a cart stage, considering you'd expect Eggman to be given the honours, providing he's the counterpart to Tails in the dark story, but no, that isn't the case. For the most part though, the name of the game remains the same. In the context of the run, 280 pretty much comes down to your driving execution, and how proficient you are in avoiding the rings while still maintaining your speed. And I have to say, this stage is certainly harder by comparison. Not only do you have these forks in the highway that split the road, that can lead to potential deaths if you drive straight forward into the bottom 
Bronze Pit, like I did a few times. The rings are placed in weird places that you can't really see coming until you get really close to them, leading to a number of close calls where I had to make a sharp turn at the last moment, when I eventually noticed the trails along the road. Look how close that was! My only advice is that you'll need to use the drift to comfortably beat this stage ringless. It's activated in a weird manner, however if you tap the A button, an audio cue will play that will make it sound like your car is out of control, but this allows you to make far sharper turns, which is pretty much required in approaching a lot of the winding highways and literal 90 degree turns. After 3 laps we eventually catch up to Tails beating Reach away to without collecting any rings. Rather difficult in comparison but still a freebie in the run nonetheless. Despite her best efforts, Tails is able to evade his pursuers, soaring above the creeping mountainscapes of Pumpkin Hill, forcing Shadow himself to tail the tornado on the next speed stage of the run, Skyrail. Now Skyrail sounds about as tedious as you'd expect. With the level taking place well above ground level, the layout basically consists of rail after rail that you need to use to reach the scarce amount of platforming sections up the various rock formations. It's not a bad level per se, however the linearity seriously doesn't help when you're spending most of your time holding the B button and doing little else. Also yes, some of the rails are actually have ring trails along them, making this a tad more tricky than you would expect. Right from the start we can't catch a break, as the rail shadow starts on has a ring trail further down. A bit of advice is that you actively want to slow yourself down at all times when rail grinding, just to make sure you don't accidentally run into anything. As soon as we gain control of shadow we needed to switch to the rail to the side of us to avoid the wrist ring trail, and then back to the other rail to avoid the oncoming ring trail reaching solid ground. Nothing else from this point really gave us any trouble, until the next rail beyond this short platforming section. As you use the spring fans to carry you walk through home and attack spamming? There is a ring container ahead of us but it's easily avoidable thankfully. The problem starts as we make our way to the rock pillar that we need to reach the top after to hit the next checkpoint. Not only do we have ring containers on either side of the rail forcing us to switch consecutively without falling off, which believe me is extremely easy to do due to the junk of the mechanic. Once we have cleared this door there is a spring, a spring that pushes us into the ring street's bounce path and at first glance there appears to be no other way to reach the summit. Well, at least until I noticed a platform of sorts at the base of the rock pillar as Shadow was falling into the pit below. Because of the draw distance though I couldn't really see anything there, however I kinda guessed that it was solid collision and sure enough it was. Reaching the platform was extremely awkward yet again because of the camera, since it always tries to keep Shadow in focus you can never really see what's below you until you fall close enough, which means a lot of the times we just straight up undershot our home attack after jumping off the rail. On the successful attempt though we found yet another spring fan that will actually take us above the springs to get another one of these fans, allowing us to skip the spring and reach the next checkpoint ringless. Believe it or not we have just cleared the hardest section of the stage. Whilst yeah, there is one ring container on the rail to the right, we can just hit the rail to the left to avoid it. Aside from this one container though, there are no more rings placed along the final few rails, making the rest of Skyrail a pleasant time to grind through. The only thing that we really had to be cautious of was the section where we had to use the fan springs to reach the peak of this next mountain. On one of the higher platforms there is a ring container box placed in the centre, making it easy to home and attack into when you're trying to get off the spring. What you need to do here is time shadows home and attack against the lip of this ledge, and similarly to Crazy Gadget, you just need to let his momentum push him onto the platform, in order for us to simply jump over the container locking onto the final spring fan. Clearing out the barrage of gummex towards the end of the stage, we evade the metal tanks that can't actually be destroyed to my knowledge, to beat Skyrail without collecting any rings. As Tails and friends succeed in finding the keys to the hidden base, Eggman intercepts them with a the mighty egg golem. Sonic himself proving too much with Stone Colossus, he destroys the restraining mechanism in the heat of the battle, removing the golem from Eggman's control. With no other choice, the good old scientist takes on the Colossus himself, before he is outright destroyed in the process. After part 1 of this series released, I received a really lovely comment from Tech Rules, and in said comment he mentioned that I wouldn't like the Egg Golem encounter in the Dark Story, and at the time I was bewildered by what he meant, as from my recollection, the Egg Golem in the Dark Story is extremely easy to face. That was until we actually got here in the routing and lo and behold, we failed the challenge. It seems that Sonic Team didn't learn from their days of deciding Big the Cat story in the previous game, as because of Eggman's large hitbox we are forced to collect a ring upon spawning into the battle. Why do you always do this to me, Zuka? It sucks as nothing else in this counter actually prevents us from clearing this ringless. The Egg Golem now malfunctioning due to the ass kicking it received from Sonic turns its attention to its creator. With the mechanical switch now destroyed, we must barrage it with Eggman's pellets to reveal the power packs underneath its chest, free in total. Destroy all three and we can move on. Nothing really changes in this battle from the last time we faced him. For all intents and purposes the Egg Golem's moveset remains the same. He'll approach you with a number of slams with its head and hands, attacks powerful enough to destroy the footholds meaning we have to destroy him before that happens. Thanks in part to the mech's health bar, all we needed to do was stand in front of the golem and mash the B button. We can tank a number of hits meaning the only time that you'll actually need to move is when the foothold underneath us is about to collapse. Although if you're aggressive enough you don't need to worry about that either, clearing egg golem with only a single ring.
ring. Meanwhile, in the control room, the Art Rouge is contacted by Eggman himself, warning her of Team Hero's intrusion. Under the facade of assistance, Rouge is yet again able to trick Eggman as he reveals the password to the Art's control room, giving her access to the Space Colony's functions, as well as the classified research stored there from the events of 50 years ago. Like, I understand that Rouge is a double agent, but come on Eggman, you have an IQ of 300, and you're this gullible? With her mission complete, the Treasure Hunter has one final loose end to tie up, venturing through the sheer insanity of Mad Space in the final treasure hunting stage of the Dark Story. Mad Space is the final treasure hunting stage of the Dark Story, and what can I say about this place that hasn't already been said? It's such a crap stage, man. Not only do you have to contend with the gravity mechanic of the planets themselves, a feature I swear Super Mario Galaxy stole from this game, but in a similar vein to Meteor Herd, the stage is just massive, extending far beyond the spawning area in terms of horizontal scale. Wait, are you serious? I thought they would have learned their lesson by now. Yes, Mad Space is impossible to beat Ringless. For some baffling reason, this is the only stage in the game where Rouge falls from the gear while spawning into the stage. And just like Beat the Cat, her controls lock up completely until you hit the ground. So of course, he had to place a total of three rings between Rouge and the starting platform. You can't make this shit up. Why does it do this? This is the only stage in the entire game treasure hunting wise that does this. I really don't get it. With that said, if you can't beat this Ringless, what is the least amount of rings that's needed to beat Mad Space? Well, only the three you start with. Nothing within the stage itself impedes you from being it ringless, aside from the ridiculous spawn. By taking one of the three rockets, we reach the first planet with the gravity mechanic. As I mentioned before, it's pretty much what you'd expect from a Mario Galaxy game, except far worse. If you go beyond a certain point of the planet, the gravity will begin to mess up, leaving you pretty much stuck until you can find your way back up. It's also really difficult to actually leave the planet's orbit, as Rouge will just continue to orbit around it. Don't get me wrong, it's a really cool concept, it's just that the execution leaves a lot to be desired. Anyway, we do find the second Emerald Shard placed in a floating wooden crate on the grass planet. Because of their floating state, you can't actually break them, as Rouge will drill dive through them collecting the Emerald piece. Luckily, we didn't have too much trouble with actually leaving the planet's gravity on this run, and after exploring the starting area of the stage where I glide, we take the next rocket to the other planets. The next Emerald Shard laid above the second moon sphere, sitting on the roof of the cargo units making it an easy find. With nowhere else left to search, we take the final rocket to the very peak of the stage, searching around the structures for any signs. It wasn't long until we discovered the final Emerald Shard buried into the side of this meteor platform. Form. Because the radar had the exclamation mark indicating that we should dig, I did, only to hit a goddamn 20 ring container box. I'm not even joking when I say the Emerald Shard was literally slightly to the left of where we initially digged, completing mad space with 23 rings. However, it is beatable with the initial 3 rings you start with. Even if this stage was possible ringless, I wasn't going to restart because of a ring container box placed right next to the Emerald Shard in a situation where I'm unable to see either. I'm sorry but that was just bollocks. Somehow gaining readings from two separate Chaos Emeralds despite having six of them already in his possession, Eggman himself heads to the Space Colony to tackle whatever Sonic and Tails have planned. Before he can actually reach the research facility however, he must venture through the outside of the Ark, in the final mech stage of the Dark Story, Cosmic Wall. Now Cosmic Wall is the final mech stage of the Dark Story, and is the one most people actually remember when it comes to this playstyle. As I mentioned before during Weapons Bed, this stage is the second level that actually changes the physics of the mech itself, whereas Weapons Bed cranks up the acceleration of the mech tenfold, Cosmic Wall has a similar impact on your control when it comes to vertical height due to the low gravity of the arc, providing greater verticality to Eggman's base jump, and even allowing the hover to actually push you upward rather than its usual glide. While subtle, the change is a welcoming one, and succeeds in getting rid of one of the major issues of the mech's controls, that being just how clunky they mostly are. However, don't be fooled as it doesn't make this stage any easier to traverse. Cosmic Wall being designed around the higher jumping mind with its overall platform heavy design and the fact that a playthrough has a tendency to last over 7 minutes, even without our challenge stipulation. The first section of this massive stage can be brutal at the best of times. Not only are we forced to contend with the ring trails along the narrow platforms, we also have to make sure to evade the barrage of enemies out for Eggman's blood. From the artificial chaos to Gun's mech army, it's incredibly easy to be overwhelmed by their sheer numbers. In hindsight, I probably did make it harder for myself. You see, because of the two ring containers at the very start of the stage, it left me second guessing and just to make sure we weren't blindsided by anything else, we just flew over everything, putting Eggman's enhanced mobility to great use. This did make some of the enemies, specifically those with the projectiles, far more awkward to avoid however, but we were successful in reaching the first checkpoint unscathed. Don't worry though, it only got a lot worse from here. In Cosmic Wall specifically, there are these triangular structures that serve to block our path. They can be really annoying as it takes several shots of Eggman's pellets to clear the way, which slowed us down a ton allowing the gummix to inflict a tiny bit of damage. We almost ended up colliding straight into a ring here as well, as a loot trail was placed underneath one of the barricades forcing us into the centre, only to be pushed closer towards him from the projectiles of the mechs. We were able to survive this and reach the second checkpoint, although not without heavy casualties. 
Upon taking even more damage from the haunting shots of the mechs, leaving us in the red, we were forced to restart upon collecting a ring as we took the spring to the next section. Granted, this was kind of my fault for rushing, but it was still kicking the ground regardless. The next section consisting of a vertical shack can be pretty annoying due to the set camera. Making use of Eggman's higher jump, we slowly make our way up so we can reach the pulley to the next section. Scaling each platform whilst avoiding the myriad of enemies, ring trails and containers blocking the way. My advice here is to take this section extremely slow. Because of the terrible camera, if you're rushing, you aren't able to see what's actually ahead of you until it's too late, which ended up causing several resets, in part due to the rings covered by more than metal structures. Damage management plays a major part in clearing this stage in particular, as the best course of action a lot of the times is to simply damage the your way through. Because of the containers present, it's just too risky to even clear out the enemies unless you're sure you won't accidentally hit the ring containers. After clearing this section literally right before the checkpoint, we ended up hitting a ring container hidden behind the wall to the left, in an attempt to clear out the artificial chaos in our way. Now how is that fair? So on the next attempt, through the magic of hindsight we ignored them completely, finally reaching the next checkpoint. Riding along the linear rail track, we are ambushed by a Blitzkrieg of Hazards, which are encouraged to lock onto in order to rack up a bunch of points, that are essentially in obtaining the A rank for the stage. This is by far the most engaging set piece of the stage, emphasising the gunplay of the mechs and adapting its strengths into a fun little arcade shooter, enticing you to rack up the points for your knowledge of the lock-on system, which helps in making an otherwise dull loading time a thrilling little side game of its own. Unfortunately, or fortunately for us in this case, the illusion of danger is broken the moment you realise that only a handful of enemies actually have the ability to damage you here. Most if not all of the projectiles will straight up miss you, only threatened by the artificial chaos that can rock up beside you on the straightaways. This was a godsend for us as the ring containers really prevented us from defending ourselves accordingly if the machines had remotely decent aiming, the only damage we took being from the extendable arms of the spherical chaos enemies, reaching the next checkpoint. As we reached the vital section of the stage, the last vertical shaft was far longer, didn't really pose any unique problems that we hadn't already encountered throughout the rest of the stage. None of the enemies are really a threat here, so there was no reason to risk hitting the ring containers as we simply push by them. The rail section standing between us and the goal only got interesting at the very end as well. During the incline a gigantic drill pursued Eggman down the track. I used to believe that the game required you to destroy it before you can reach the goal ring, however that isn't the case, you just have to survive long enough. In order to do so we have to shoot at the mini drill things surrounding the one in the centre. With each one you destroy this will slow the weapon down for a brief moment, widening the distance between us. As long as you continuously shoot at the thing it will never get close enough to actually damage you. On a occasion a ring container will pass by you on either side but I don't actually think you can collect them. I might have just gotten lucky in this regard but none of our homing shots actually locked onto any of them and with only 3 of the drills remaining we finally reached the end of the stage completing Cosmic War without collecting any rings. Upon finally reaching the research facility, he discovers Amy left by herself after Sonic and Tails rush out to accomplish their goal of destroying the Eclipse Cannon, literally threatening her at gunpoint she is used as a hostage, forcing Sonic to retreat in order to save her. Thinking that they could trick Eggman with a fake emerald, they are shocked to discover Eggman was always one step ahead of them, and after Sonic is sealed into the capsule, he is expelled from the Ark, to die in the harsh conditions of space. Heeding his last words, Tails confronts Eggman in their final rival counter of the run, and despite winning the battle, it was Eggman who ultimately won the war. Escaping with the final Chaos Emerald, he returns to the control room to finally put his plan into motion. Meanwhile, after gathering all the information she needed on both Eggman's intentions and the top secret Project Shadow, Rouge intends to swipe the emeralds while she still can, only to be confronted by Shadow himself. Shadow now caught on to Rouge's true identity as a government spy, she reveals the fruits of her research, essentially taunting the ultimate life form over his murky past. Before Shadow had any time to comprehend any of this, Eggman intrudes through the radio, forcing Shadow to venture to the Eclipse Cannon, preventing the unknown threat from halting their endgame. Whilst this scene does a lot to really show us the true resolve of Shadow, in wanting to fulfil the wish of who was essentially his only family, the whole You're Not Real plotline kinda comes out of left field. Nothing else in the story aside from Shadow's memory loss even indicates that there might be another Shadow somewhere, and even then the image on the article shows a prototype the Shadow, the Bio Lizard. I don't know, it just seems like maybe something was lost in translation here, or they shut this plotline in so abruptly for dramatic effects. If nothing else, it does highlight rather well that there is more to this story than meets the eye, and the notion that there is a good chance Shadow's memories could have been tampered with. Regardless with that, we reach the final stage of the dark story, appropriately named Final Chase. Quite like Final Rush, Final Chase is a stage set on the outside of the arc, mainly consisting of ground rails and floating platforms that it can be rather tricky to reverse. Whilst overall Shadow's final stage is far less open than Final Rush, it does introduce a gimmick we only see once in the entire game, these gravity cylinders. They function as you'd expect. Once Shadow is close enough, the gravity will attract you onto it, so we can travel along them either vertically or horizontally to reach the next part of the stage. Unfortunately, quite like Mad Space are extremely janky in execution, and this stems from the fact that 
that Shadow will remain in constant motion when standing along one of them. Instead of just simply sticking into the cylinder, instead he will constantly orbit around it and this alone makes Final Chase cumbersome to play through. You have to take things slow and you have to make sure you time your jumps along the top of these things, otherwise you're taking a nail to the void of space below. Now if that was the only thing that we would have to be wary of, it would be one thing, however that isn't the case. Along with the jank, we also have to be cautious of the meteors, as like Meteor Herd they can actually damage you. All the many artificial chaos we pretty much have to platform across all the while contending with the fact that we can die in a single hit. Seriously, screw this stage. Right from the start I was feeling a bit concerned about this entire thing, as we're immediately placed on a long winding rail that leads us to the first checkpoint. I wasn't entirely sure if any rings were placed here and thankfully they weren't, but we took an L the moment after we hit the checkpoint, as the particles from Shadow Spin Dash had to destroy one of the two ring containers close by, forcing a restart. On the next try we moved slightly forward, in order to Spin Dash jump over the gravity cylinder without running into any containers. This entire section is filled with gun mechs and artificial chaos so we had to tread cautiously evading them both, and trying our best to skip as many of the gravity cylinders as possible. When it comes to the meteors, I think they will only start crumbling once Shadow has gotten close enough to them. So to reverse this next section safely, you can just run up to them and then quickly retreat and that will cause them to explode clearing the way. Luckily, the second checkpoint loomed just ahead, as we quickly crossed the multiple cylinders all the while avoiding meteors and even the gun mechs with a number of jumps. It's then when the magic of the light speed dash strikes again, activating by complete accident just after we hit the checkpoint. I wasn't even facing the ring trail. It's here where Final Chase goes from a mildly difficult stage into one of the worst levels we've ever had to do in one of these challenge runs. Jumping into the hole we're pushed onto a rail through the many dash pads, and thanks to the camera angle you have little time to react to the ring trail along the upcoming platform. My best advice is to intentionally slow Shadow down after hitting the dash pad by jumping, and this will give you more than enough time to react to the rings ahead. Whatever you do though, do not home and attack into the spring, as doing so will lock Shadow into the middle which will then push you into the rings. Instead hit the side and make your way over to the top of the gravity cylinder. Now this entire section pretty much requires you to reverse across multiple barrels to reach the higher section of the stage, all the while avoiding the worst variant of the artificial chaos, the ones capable of hitting you at range with their arms. You can't even risk home and attacking into them either due to the many, many ring containers throughout this section. What this essentially boils down to is timing your jumps carefully so Shadow is facing the correct way when you go to home and attack to the next barrel. My first thought was to just stand on the very top of them and whilst you can do that for a few of them, one in particular places a ring container up there which makes timing our home and attack into the artificial chaos extremely awkward. You really don't want to rush this section either as it's easy to fall off the barrels completely into Shadow's death and if that occurs you'll have to restart this section from the beginning. Whilst it didn't take me too long we did encounter our fair share of close calls because of the janky hitbox of the barrels. Ooh, don't do that Shadow. With the hard part over we still aren't finished yet unfortunately, as we have another three barrels to traverse before we can seek refuge at the checkpoint. Granted it is far easier this time around, as whilst there are rings extending vertically from the top of the barrels, there aren't any containers around so we can home and attack our way across safely. To minimise all the combat encounters we could, I decided to instead spend dash over to the first barrel, rather than chaining off the artificial chaos which almost ended up screwing us over. Due to Shadow's momentum something weird happened where he was pushed off the barrel and almost fell into the bottom's pit. The gravity was thankfully able to reattach Shadow to the cylinder, but it was almost a disaster. Lady Luck smiled upon us as we avoided the final few chaos monsters, hitting the checkpoint and grinding down the rail to reach the next section of the stage. From this point Final Chase borrows heavily from the stage layout of Final Rush, only including the barrels which actually helped us out in clearing this next part. Since we're actually able to jump along the top of them, we're able to use them as a launch pad to give Shadow some major airtime, clearing a large portion of this next section from above. The grind rails ahead possess no rings either, making this final portion a breeze to rush through. Well, until the end of the stage, where the design devolves into nothing but the cylinders. Upon hitting the spring, Shadow is pushed up one of the four barrels tits on their side. We need to jump above to land on each of them until we reach the final aligned vertically. This can result in failure if you try to rush through. Although I quickly discovered that for a few of them, the gravity is actually prevalent enough to drag Shadow onto the ones above, without you needing to actually jump so you can use that to your advantage. The goal ring lies beyond one final obstacle course of barrels, so once we avoid the rings along the platform taking the ground rail up to this final section, there are a number of springs that will push you to the barrels far out right from where we need to go, so aside from the fifth spring, we just need to avoid everything else riding the pulley that will face us ahead of an artificial chaos. As scary as this is with no rings, as long as you act quickly enough you can outspeed its attacks destroying it before it can hit you with its laser eyes, using this extra altitude to home and attack onto the barrel leading us to the rocket. 
After this, all we have to do is rush down the final cylinder so we can hit the spring to complete the stage. There are a ton of meteors placed down the length so we have to be quick otherwise we won't survive. For as janky as this can be, all you really need to do is hold down on the analog stick. Sometimes Shadow will jerk off the foothold, but the gravity should pull you back before he has any chance to fall from the stage. And with that, final chase is completed without collecting any rings. While Sonic is ultimately successful in defeating Shadow, holding the Eclipse Cannon for the time being, Eggman places the final emerald into the console. His ambitions of world domination no at arm's reach, disaster strikes as the arc enters a critical state, concluding this challenge with the knowledge that, no, you unfortunately cannot beat the dark story of Sonic Adventure 2 without collecting any rings. And with that, we've reached the conclusion of part 2 of this challenge series. Yes, again, we unfortunately failed the challenge, but given the fact that the rings we were forced to collect were beyond our control, I'm inclined to call this a success. Everything that the game had to throw at us when we actually had full control over the characters, we were able to overcome. So for now, I'm content with moving on. So with that said, join us next week for the exciting conclusion when we take on the last story to see where it's possible to clear it without collecting any rings. Before this video concludes, I just want to take a moment to thank each and every one of you who have supported this series and the channel thus far. The amount of love you've shown since this channel's beginning has just been overwhelming, and I cannot put into words just how thankful I am for this community. Seriously guys, thank you. If you have any ideas of future challenges that you'd like me to take on, feel free to comment them down below, and let me know what your favourite part of the series is so far. I'd love to hear your thoughts. For now though, I've taken up enough of your time, so take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye for now. The ultimate life the form. End of man. Chaos control. Space Desperation. Super Sonic. Collision. Untamed power. Maria. Professor Crisis. Gerald. Apocalypse. The truth Force. about 50 the years ago. Everything. Sonic Adventure 2. Last episode. Wishes are eternal.